Okay, hello everybody. This is the first video for the pre-calculus class. Um, my name is Jessica Lopez. I am the instructor. So I just wanted you to know that I am the one that's going to be giving the lectures. Um, they're not pre-selected from stuff that's already on YouTube or anything like that. It is me um, going over everything the way I want to be able to go over everything um, and show you the techniques and the methods that I prefer you use. Um, however, mathematics is very interesting because there's never just one way to do a problem. Um, sometimes there is, but a lot of times there's multiple ways to do the problem. Now, I have taught math and I have been tutoring math since 2002, so about 18 years now. And one thing that I pride myself on is the fact that I really try to find one method or one strategy that's going to work all the time for a particular concept. Um, and then that's usually the one that I always teach or the one that I stick with. So I don't prefer to show you the five different ways that you could do something because that tends to confuse people, okay? So if you already have been taught something in the past and I'm showing you something different, um, there's nothing wrong with you using the technique that you used in the past. The only time that it becomes an issue is if you get the answer incorrect. So I can follow, I'm sorry for the interruption. I do have small children at home doing homeschool, so they tend to um, be vocal a little bit. Um, but um, let me continue where I was. So sometimes when you're doing something, they, um, there could be five different ways. I'm not gonna show you all five ways. I'm only gonna show you one way. Um, and if whatever method that you had previously learned or that you've developed on your own for some re or for instance, um, you can use it as long as you get the problems correct 100% of the time using that method, okay? Um, if your method only works for some problems and not for other problems, then that's probably not a legitimate method, okay? Um, so I'll show you one on a test. You're more than welcome to use another method. Um, I can follow pretty much every single method that, that, that exists to do these problems. So if you're using a different method than mine, as long as you're showing the steps to that method, I should be able to follow it and be able to, um, let you know where there was a mistake in your own method. Um, not just the one that I am teaching you. But I just want to make that a word because the very first section that we're going to cover is 2.5 partial fraction decomposition. And there are a few ways to do these problems, okay? Um, I prefer method over the others, but there are multiple ways to do it. Um, I know of two typical ways that we do it here in America, but I do know that there's um, a couple of other methods that we do not use in this country typically when we teach it. However, I have had other students introduce me to different methods, so, and I usually can follow along with those as well. The only thing that you're not allowed to do is just write the answer, okay? So when you're taking the test, make sure you're showing your steps on how you're coming up with these solutions. That's very important. Um, it's not necessarily the answers, because half the time we're gonna get the answers wrong. Um, so it's not necessarily the answers that I want, to analyze when I am trying to give out grades, it's are you understanding the concepts? Are you understanding the applications of these theorems and these properties and methods? Um, and that is my, that is the goal. I mean, I want to instill these techniques upon you and um, I want to be able to see if you can actually execute them on your own. So I do award partial credit when it comes to tests. It's not a fact of is it right or is it wrong, but in that same degree, I am also not just accepting the answers five, right? Um, because you could have used the graphing calculator to come up with that answer without any knowledge of the process or the steps to get that five, okay? And so what I want to be grading you on is your methods and your techniques and your applications. Okay, that's very, very important because when you get to calculus, if you don't have that strong foundation of being able to develop these solutions and being able to explain on paper mathematically, um, you're going to have a lot of issues when you get to calculus. It's just going to go way over your head. 
but you have to be very, you have to condition yourself now to learn to write like a mathematician. Basically, that's what it boils down to, okay? So when I write things, of course, I am a mathematician, so of course, I'm gonna write everything formally. I expect you all to do the exact same thing. So like I explained in the orientation a little bit that, or in the syllabus, that you'll be expected to take your test and then you'll be expected to um, give the paperwork. And I've had a few students already text me and they use the phrase um, scratch paper, okay? And I really try to stay away from that because if you think of your paperwork as scratch paper, chances are you are not going to write the appropriate amount of um, steps to have a full-blown um, solution, okay? A mathematically explainable solution. Um, chances are you're just going to have like a five here and a fraction there and an expression here. And then in your brain, it makes sense and you come up with the answer five, right? That's not what I want to see. I want to be able to read what is going on in your brain, okay? That's really, that's what you need to think about. I'm going to tell my teacher exactly what I did, how I did it, why I did it, okay? Then I can really, really understand where you are. And if there needs to be some um, critiquing or some correcting or anything like that, um, that is my opportunity to, to, um, to do it inside your paperwork, okay? Now you can submit paperwork for like a test review. So when you do your test reviews, um, when you do your test reviews, you can submit your paperwork for that just so that I could take a look at it and see how you're uh, developing your solutions. And if it's um, sufficient, then you basically just need to do the same kind of thing on the test. But if there's a couple of problems on the review where you, what you're showing on paper does not work, it's not explaining everything fully, um, that could be my opportunity to let you know before you take the test, okay? And so you'll see me post things like that, like, hey, um, last chance for you to submit your paperwork so that I can review it so you have an idea of what I'm expecting on the test um, and things like that. And I will do it for each test because each test is different. They have different things happening. Um, and so you may have understood how to um, draw out your conclusions on paper in chapter seven, but then when we get to chapter eight, it might be a different story and you might have things that are incomplete. So it's very important that for each chapter, um, I at least give you the opportunity to show me your paperwork before you go take the test, okay? So enough about all of that, because I know this video was supposed to be about 12.5, but it is our very first video. So I definitely wanted to address some um, concerns, okay? Um, the second concern that I have is with your homework. So in each homework assignment, there are what are called media items. And those media items need to be viewed before your questions, okay? If for some reason the questions are visible and you have not clicked the media, understand that the media will still affect your um, score. So if there's 10 questions and, or let's say there's six questions, right? And then there's four media. So I've got six questions and then four media. That's 10 points. If you did not view the four media, but you answered all six questions correct, you're only gonna get a 60 on that uh, assignment. So that's why it's very important that um, you view all the video as well. So you get all the points for that particular assignment, okay? Now, Let's go ahead and go into 12.5. So I've wasted about 12 minutes and 50, or about 10 minutes or so on um, all of the announcements, okay? If I need to give any other announcements, I'll do them as well in the future videos. So um, let me see here. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here with you so that you can see my paper. And then eventually I will also share 
my um, my computer screen when we get to the assignments inside the web assign. Okay. So the first thing we have is 12.5, the title is partial fraction decomposition. And it says, we know how to add rational expressions. In other words, to add a single rational expression, let's explore this. So if I have these two fractions that I need to add, the first thing you would do is write equivalent fractions where the denominators are the same. So I would have to multiply the first fraction by x plus 4 over x plus 4. And I would have to multiply the second fraction by x plus 2 over x plus 2. So that when I'm finished, I have x plus 4 and x plus 2, or the reverse, it doesn't matter. Remember, multiplication is what we call commutative which means it doesn't matter which is in front or in back. When you multiply them, you'll still get the same result, okay? Um, but on the top, I will end up with 2 times x plus 4 plus 4 times x plus 2. And if I distribute that, I have 2x plus 8 over, oops, got to continue, plus 4x plus 8 over x plus 4 and x plus 2. Then if I combine my like terms, I have 6x plus 16 over x plus 4 and x plus 2. So essentially, what partial fraction decomposition does um, is it undoes this process. So what you have is, is you could start off with a function that looks like this. right? And, or another function, a fraction that looks like this. And then they want you to take that and turn it into this. Okay, so they want you to break up that fraction. Now, there's a process on how we do this. The first thing you want to do is always make sure that one, you're talking about a proper fraction. Okay, if you, if you have an improper fraction, you actually have to divide first and turn it into like a mixed number kind of thing, okay? And when we get to the uh, problems in the homework, we'll definitely have some examples of that, okay? So it's going to undo the process. Now there are four different cases and the cases depend on what is happening in that denominator. So when I factor this denominator, I get x plus 4 and x plus 2. Those are two distinct linear factors, okay? And that is uh, what case one is, is two distinct linear factors or two non-repeated linear factors. Distinct means different. Um, not only different, not only do they have to be different, but they can't repeat, meaning I can't have x plus 4 with a square, okay? If it has a square or a third power, that means that that factor repeats, right? That's what a square or a third power means. It means that factor times itself multiple times, okay? So let's see here. It says if that's the case, then the denominator q can be factored like this, where each of these numbers are different numbers, okay? And notice that none of them have an exponent. If that is the scenario that we have, then we end up with a one number over that first factor plus a second number over the second factor. And depending on how many factors you have, this could keep going on and on and on to so many um, fractions. So here's the first one we have. It says, this problem has only non-repeated linear factors. Well, let's see and verify that it does, okay? So I have this, and if I were to factor that, I would have x plus, no, I would not. I would have x minus 3 and x minus 2. These factors add to give me negative 5, and when I multiply them, they give me positive 6. So those are the two factors. 
When you have fives and six, you really have to be careful with the signs because it could be three and two or it could be one and six, okay? So be very careful with your factoring. Um, and so then here, this can be turned into one number over x minus three plus another number over x minus two. Now again, just like it doesn't matter which way you put it here, it doesn't matter which one goes first here. All that's important is that once you figure out what A is, that you put it over the correct fraction where you had the A. And when you find out what B is, again, you put it over that fraction. So the idea here is to solve this equation for A and B, okay? And so this is where the different strategies come in that I have, you first step you have to do is all the same. In order for me to solve a fraction equation, the first thing you wanna do is multiply by the common denominator. Give me one second. So then the common denominator here is x minus 3 and x minus 2. So if I multiply that to all three fractions, what's going to happen is, is that both of these denominators are going to cancel in the first fraction. No, ma'am. Here, the x minus threes are gonna cancel. Here, the x minus twos are gonna cancel. And then now you end up with this equation over here. Okay, so, when we're trying to solve this equation, the first thing I do is I expand this out completely. So I'm going to distribute the A and then I'm gonna group. So on the left side, I'm gonna group my X's together and then my constants. Since I have no constants, this would be like an imaginary zero. Here, I'm going to have AX plus BX. And then for my constant, I'm going to have negative 2A minus 3B. So then what I need to do, if I go one step further, this has a coefficient of 1 and an invisible constant of 0. Here, it's A plus B times X. And over here, I have negative 2A minus 3B. The only way for this left side to equal the right side is if this coefficient is equivalent to that coefficient. And if this constant is equivalent to that constant. Now remember, A and B are just numbers that we're trying to find. So these are in fact going to be considered our constant and not our variable x like we have in this expression, okay? So what I end up with here is a system of equations. And from here, whatever method you use to solve systems of equations is completely fine to me. Whether you use substitution or whether you use elimination, that's up to you. I prefer elimination, so when you see me working these out, you will see me use the elimination method which means in order for these two variables to eliminate, I need this to have a positive 2a. So I'm going to take this entire equation and multiply it by a positive 2. The result I'm going to write underneath, which is 2, 2a plus 2b. I get 2 equals negative 1b. And then to solve for b, I divide by negative 1 on both sides and I end up with that a positive B equals a negative two. Then I'm going to take that negative two and I'm gonna plug it back into either one of these original equations to figure out what A is. I'm gonna go ahead and plug it into the top one. 
So I have one equals a plus a negative two, or that's the same thing as saying a minus two. So if I add two to both sides of this equation, I get three equals a. So now I have found the number for a and I have found the number for b. So it's very important you pay attention to which variable you put on top of which factor. Since a was over x minus three, that means my value three should be over the factor x minus three. Then b is over the factor x minus two, which means negative two should go over x minus two. You can put your signs together and instead write your final answer as three over x minus three minus two over x minus two. And so that is how uh, partial fraction decomposition works. The only thing that's gonna be different for the other three cases is this setup. The process after that is always going to be the same. Multiplying by the common denominator, getting your um, equation without fractions, distributing everything, grouping your terms together, and you can do all of this grouping stuff um, visually. Like for instance, I do not ever write this step or this step. As soon as I have everything factored, or not factored, multiplied out, I go straight from this to this. So I say my coefficient of x is 1, and then my coefficient of all the other x's is a and a plus b. Then I have no constant on this side, so the constant would be 0, and the constants over here, basically the terms without an x, are negative 2a and negative 3b. Okay. Um, so I do not write these two steps typically whenever I'm doing the problem on my own, and they're not necessary. It is completely visual. I just wanted to explain to you the first go round of why they, why I can do that, okay? Once we know why we can do it, then we can just do it after that. Now, um, one thing I wanna address is in the homework. So let me pull up the homework. I've already clicked on my media, so it already has little green checks next to it. Let me go ahead and click on question one. So, give it a second so it can refill. Okay, so it says determine whether the rational expression is proper or improper. If the expression is improper, rewrite it as the sum of a polynomial and a proper rational expression. And so the um, problem that they gave me is x cubed plus x squared minus 16x plus 19 over x squared plus 3x minus 12. Now, um, one thing that we have to do is we have to compare our degrees in order to decide whether or not the um, fractions are proper. When they're proper, it means that the numerator is smaller than the denominator. So for us, it means that the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. If the numerator is greater than the denominator, then it is not proper, it is improper, and we have to divide to turn it into a proper fraction. And in this case, my highest exponent over here is three. So the degree of my numerator is actually equal to three. And if I look at the bottom, the highest exponent is two. So the degree of my denominator is two. So the degree of my numerator is bigger than my denominator which means mine is going to be improper. So that's one piece of information that the problem asks for. The second thing that they ask for is if it is improper, then turn it into a proper fraction, okay? Or an expression with a proper fraction, okay? So what that means is you take your denominator and you divide 
into your numerator. And one thing I did not mention, but I was lucky here because everything is in descending order and there are no missing terms, okay? If it is not in descending order or and, if it is missing terms, that is important, okay? You have to have it in descending order and you cannot have any missing terms. You'd have to fill them in with zeros. We may or may not in, uh, have that situation happen to us today, but we'll see. Um, so we have x cubed squared x and then constant. x squared x and constant. So in descending order, perfect. Um, I don't have any terms missing whatsoever. So you start with the first guys. I'm gonna go back to long division, that whole process, right? You look at just the first terms. It's the inside term divided by the outside term. That gives me X. That is the first entry that I'm going to put in my um, top here, my quotient. Then what happens to this X? This X is going to get distributed by every single one of these terms on the outside. And the responses go down here. So we end up with x cubed plus 3x squared minus 12x. But when we work out problems like this, we have to subtract these values. Now, when you subtract these values, you end up having to distribute that minus. So this guy ends up becoming negative, this one becomes negative, and this one becomes positive, okay? So I'm going to be using my red symbols whenever I go to um, reduce this. So x cubed minus x cubed cancels. x squared minus 3x squared is negative 2x squared. Negative 16. My or negative 16 plus 12x is negative 4x, and then I'm going to bring down my plus 19. Now I repeat the whole process again and take this first term and divide it by this first term. Here the x squareds will cancel and I'll get negative 2. So negative 2 comes up here. If this were a positive 2, I would have to put plus 2 up here. Then again, anything that's up here has to get distributed. So this would become negative 2x squared. This would become negative 6x, um, positive 24. And then again, I would have to subtract this entire thing. So this negative and negative would change to positive, negative and negative goes to positive, negative and positive changes it to negative. So now I have negative 2x squared plus 2x squared. They cancel. Negative 4x plus 6x. I get 2x. 19 minus 24. I get negative 5. Now if I go to try to repeat the process again, I have 2x over x squared. This will reduce one of them, but I get 2 over x. As soon as this, you see a fraction here, that means you need to stop. You cannot go any further, okay? You cannot put this up here and then start doing the whole process. It doesn't work like that, okay? Um, so what you've gotta do is you've gotta stop. As soon as you get a fraction here, and when I say a fraction, it's with X in the denominator. If you have the fraction two thirds, that's just a, a number. You can put two thirds here. You just can't have X in the denominator in your fraction. Okay, so I'm gonna stop. How do I write my answer? Anytime you have um, the numerator over your denominator, your answer when you reduce that is always gonna be the quotient plus the remainder over that original denominator. So in my case, that means that x cubed plus x squared minus 16x plus 19 over this is equivalent to x minus 2 plus 2x minus 5 over x squared plus 3x minus 12. Now, this is an expression with a proper fraction. 
because the degree of my numerator here is just one. The highest exponent for x is one. And the degree of the denominator here is still two. But now the numerator's degree is smaller than the denominator's degree. So if I go back to my assignment, um, I would say it is improper and then I would have to type in the response that I received, which is um, 2x minus 5 over x squared plus 3x minus 12. And check it. And it is good. So then the next problem is the exact same thing. Notice that it has x cubed, that's three, and the bottom has x squared, so that's two. The only issue with this one is, is when you try, I'm not gonna do the problem just because I don't wanna do another one, but I will show you how to set it up. This video, this section is really long and the video is already getting pretty lengthy. So let me stop here and go over to the camera. So here's what we've got. The top degree is bigger than the bottom degree, so it is improper. But notice that you're missing the x term down here. So you would have to put plus 0x and then your constant. For the numerator, you have x cubed. You do not have any x, x squared, so you have to do plus zero x squared, then the seven x, and then the minus nine. So putting this in here is basically like keeping your place values, okay? So you have to have them in here when you do all of the rest of the problem. I won't do it just because we don't have, the video will be super, super long if I do every single problem. Now, this is case one. Notice you have x and x minus three. Those are two linear factors and they are completely different from one another and neither one of them repeats, meaning neither one of them has a square. So this would be a perfect case of, um, case one. So I'm going to show you the setup of what that one would look like. So that's my fraction. It's already factored for me. So I would have some number over x plus some number over the other factor. And then I will let you do all of that fraction decomposition using the example I've already given of case one. Okay. Let's go back and see what number two look or number four looks like because it'll most likely be a different case. No, it's the same case. So in that case, you would have, um, I'm gonna write it down and I'll scan these after when I post the video so that you have everything all together. So I have x over x plus one and x plus five. Again, two distinct factors. So it's just gonna be a over x plus one and b over x plus five. So again, another case one. I'm pretty sure eventually at some point we're gonna run into cases two, three, um, and four. So this one is definitely not case one. Um, you do have to remember something here. So I'm gonna write number, or 12.5 number five. And we have negative one over x cubed minus one. So this is not factored. And in order to factor it, you do have to remember your difference of two perfect cubes formula, okay? And so the formula is a cubed minus b cubed equals a minus b, a squared plus a b, minus or plus b squared. 
Okay. So let's see what we get when we do this. So here A is X, B is one. So we get X minus one, X squared plus one X or just X plus one. Now, the formula does not factor this. If this was factorable, the formula would have been different. The fact that this is not factored means that this part of the problem is prime, which means it cannot be factored further. So when you apply this to this problem, this part here is not going to be able to factor further, which means it's stuck like this. So I have a linear factor, but then now I have a quadratic factor, okay? We have not discussed this case yet, so I cannot even um, tell you which case number it is because we haven't gotten that far yet. So let's go back to the lesson and continue. We've done enough um, lesson for the first four problems of the assignment, but now in order to finish the last four, we do have to continue on with the rest of this lesson, okay? Now, when I submit this um, information, I will have the lesson as one document, and then I will include um, any extra sheets that I have as the homework portion. I've been writing them on that graph paper. So case two is what happens when you have a repeated linear factor? So still haven't talked about quadratics yet. So when you have a repeated linear factor, what happens is, is you have to use the factor as a single exponent, then a square, then a cube, then a fourth power, depending on what power the original denominator had. So let's take a look at this problem here. If I factor that denominator, the first thing I can factor out is the greatest common factor of x, and I get x squared minus 2x plus 1. And then if I factor, um, this trinomial here, I will get x minus one and x minus one. So the fraction I end up with is x plus two over x times x minus one squared. So notice this factor is linear that does not repeat. And this factor is linear, but it does repeat. So for the non-repeating factor, We will have the same thing that we had for case one, just some number over that non-repeating factor. But according to case two, you're going to have one number over that factor plus another number over the square of that factor. And I stop at the square because that's the highest that it goes. And so this is what the fraction should turn into three fractions in this particular case. Now, if I take this equation, which is the one I'm trying to solve for, and I multiply by the common denominator. Remember, the common denominator here is going to be x and x minus one squared, what was in the denominator. So when I multiply that by this first fraction, both the x and the x minus one squared are going to fact cancel. So I'm just going to end up with x plus two. However, in this fraction, only the x is going to cancel. So I'm going to have x, or I'm sorry, a times x minus one squared. B, here, one of these will cancel, but I'll still be left with x and the other x minus one. And then C, the X minus one squares will cancel and all I'll be left with is X. So let me multiply this out because we definitely need to do that. So if I square this, it's going to be X squared minus two X plus one. If you need to take this off to the side and foil it out to get this, that's totally perfectly fine. Here I'm gonna take BX times each one of these. So bx squared minus bx plus cx. And then the last thing I'm going to do is distribute a. So ax squared minus 2ax plus a plus bx squared 
minus bx plus cx. So then I'm going to create my, um, now I have x squared, which means I am going to have three equations, one for x squared coefficients, one for x coefficients, and then one for constant. So on the left-hand side, I don't have an x squared which means the coefficient on the left side is zero. On the right-hand side, I have two terms with an x squared. I have a plus b. On the left side, I have a coefficient of one for x. And on the right side, I have this term, this term, and this term with an x. So minus 2a plus b, or I'm sorry, minus b, plus c. And then the last term is the constant. I do have a constant here of 2. And the only constant I have on the right-hand side is a. And so that makes it a little bit easy to solve this uh, system of three variables because I already know what one of the letters is. It's going to be 2. I'm going to plug that into the top equation to figure out what b is. Turns out b is going to be equal to negative 2. So there's another um, number I found. And then the last one would be to plug both of these values into that middle equation and solve for c. So I get 1 equals negative 4 plus 2 plus c, negative 2 plus c, I get three equals C. So now I have all three of my numbers and I can finally write my decomposition. So A should be over X, so I get two over X, plus B should be over X minus one, negative two over X minus one, and then C should be three over X minus one squared. I can combine these signs to write a more formal solution. And that is the final answer. Okay. So we have gone over case two now, and it really was a mixture of case one and case two, because we did have a linear factor that did not repeat, but then we also had a linear factor that did repeat. Now these are recorded lectures, so I know they're gonna be a little bit lengthy because this is pre-calculus. It's probably one of the longest courses that has the most content in it. Um, and the content is not um, super simple and short, okay? It is pretty lengthy in itself. So, um, clean the camera a little bit. So just keep that in mind that these videos might last a little long, but, um, it is recorded, so you can always pause it and come back later, stop it, figure out what you're doing, and then continue. Um, you play around with the functionality of the video as you need, okay? You can always rewind and watch things over, slow it down, you know, all that is up to you. So, we're going to move on with case three, and case three is the one I needed in order to do number five on the homework. So case three is when you have irreducible, or in other words, prime, quadratic factors. So when I have repeated quadratic factors. Um, so they look like this, and this time I will have to have a linear factor on top of the quadratic factor, okay? So, this is the, uh, the sum of two squares, which cannot be factored. It is considered prime. However, it's really missing that um, second factor, right? It's missing this term in the middle. So let me get my pencil to work for me real quick. There we go. So I do have a linear factor that does not repeat. So I will have something over that factor. But then I have a quadratic that does not repeat, non-repeated. So I'm going to have cx plus d, something linear over 
my quadratic, my prime quadratic, okay? And then again, my LCD here is going to be those two factors together. So when I multiply this fraction by this LCD, the X plus one and the X plus one will cancel. I'm writing down this, or here, both of these will cancel, leaving me with one. Over here, the X plus ones will cancel, leaving me with A times X squared plus four. And in this fraction, the X squared plus fours will cancel, but leaving me with CX plus D times X plus one. Two terms times two terms, which requires me to use parentheses around both. Now, if I multiply this out, I have AX squared plus 4A, and if I FOIL that out, CX squared plus CX plus DX plus D, and then if I start to create all my coefficients. So I don't have any X squareds on this side, so it's going to be zero, and on this side I have uh, A plus C. On this side, I don't have any variables x, so the coefficient is zero. And over here, I have c plus d. And I guess I could have used b and c, but for some reason I used c and d. It's okay. Um, really doesn't matter what numbers you use. They like to use like a1, a2, a3. I like to use a, b, c, d, e, f, g, as many as I need, okay? but I could have used A and then the next letter B and then C. For some reason, I chose to use C and D and just totally skipped B. So X squared coefficients, X coefficients, and now constant. I do have a constant over here, it's one. And over here, it's four plus D, or I'm sorry, four A plus D. And so now I have to solve this system of equations, okay? Now I would want to use, again, me personally, I want to use the elimination method. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation and I'm going to multiply it by negative one. So zero times negative one is zero, C times negative one is negative C, D times negative one is negative D. When I do that, the Ds will cancel, and I get one equals four A minus C. But now if you notice, these two have the same letters. Not only that, I can already use the elimination method just the way it is. So the C's will cancel, I get one equals five A, which means A will equal one fifth if I divide both sides by five. So I've got one value. I'm gonna go back to this equation to get the second value. So zero equals one fifth plus C. If I minus one fifth, I get negative one fifth equals C. Now I'm gonna plug that into this middle equation. And so if I add one fifth, I will get one fifth equals D. And so now I have all three. It's just coincidence that they all happen to be one-fifth or negative one-fifth, okay? So then we end up with A, which is one-fifth over X plus one, plus C, which is negative one-fifth X plus one-fifth over X squared plus four. Typically, they don't like the one-fifth written like that, so you usually put it um, in the front. So that five, since it's in the denominator, just like this is in the denominator, can be written as five times X plus one. And the same thing here, I can write negative X plus one over five times X squared plus four. Now you have to be careful here because this plus sign applies to the whole fraction. So if you want to take this negative to combine with the plus sign like we had been doing in the past, you have to be very careful. You have to actually factor that negative out of the whole numerator before you can combine it with that plus. 
So essentially, I have two steps here. Now I can type this in and it will accept that, but I'm just forewarning you um, because when you get to calculus, you are going to need to learn how to keep writing this so that it makes sense, okay? So if I do wanna combine these signs, it would have to be a negative times the whole numerator. And then now I can put those together and write this as one over five times x plus one minus, but then it becomes x minus one over five times x squared plus four. And that being the more proper answer, but that doesn't mean that any of its equivalencies are not accepted. Those are also accepted. Okay, so then, um, Let's go ahead and finally, let's go back to number five. So if we look at number five here, we factored it and we had a linear factor and then we had a, a quadratic factor. So we should be able to take this fraction here and decompose it so that we have one number over the linear factor plus um, a linear function or expression over the quadratic expression. And then here the LCD is going to be x minus one, x squared plus x plus one. So on the left hand side, both of these will cancel with that LCD, leaving you with negative one. Over here on the right hand side, the x minus ones will cancel, leaving you with a times the trinomial plus bx plus d times x minus one. So then if I expand that out, we have ax squared plus ax plus a plus bx squared minus bx plus dx minus d. And then if you, simp you put all your coefficients together for your system, there's no x squareds on the left. You have a plus b on the right. No x's on the left, but you have a minus b plus d for x on the right. And then you have a negative one constant and a minus d in constants on the right. Now I won't continue the whole thing. Um, but that is how you would set it up and then you would start to do your um, process of elimination here. And this one looks a lot like the one we had. So combine maybe the first two together, that'll eliminate the D and then you can combine that result with the top one to figure out what A and B are. Okay, so let's keep going. We finally get to our case four. Actually, before I do that, let me go look back at the homework. I want to see what the following problems look like. Ah, so that is the next case, the very last case that we have to cover. So let me write that problem down. Um, I have seven X squared over X minus four squared. Actually, no, this is case two. So we do not need to uh, go back. This is case two. So this one we figured out was case three, but also a little bit of case one put together. This one here is case two twice. So you've got a repeated linear factor and another repeated linear factor, which means this one's gonna have four fractions four fractions, it's going to be super long. So we're going to have a constant over this linear factor plus another constant over the square of that linear factor plus another constant over the other factor and then another constant over the square of that factor. So four fractions here, four variables to solve for. 
it's not impossible, it's just going to be really tedious. So let's go ahead and work this one out, just so you can kind of see how this is gonna work out. So the LCD here is going to be, of course, both of those denominators. So then here, both will cancel, leaving me with seven X squared. Here, one of these will cancel, leaving me with the other one and the X plus four squared as well. Wow, this one's gonna be really long, but it's okay. Then we have B and the X minus four squared will completely wipe out and just leave me with X plus four squared. Here, the X plus four will cancel, leaving me with the other X plus four, but then I'll also still have the X minus four squared. And then finally here, the X plus four squared will cancel, but I'll still have the X minus four squared. So we have seven X squared equal to, I'm going to square all of these. So this is X squared plus eight X plus 16 x squared plus 8x plus 16, um, x squared minus 8x plus 16, and then x squared minus 8x plus 16. Okay. So we're going to now multiply all of this stuff out. So first I'm gonna distribute this, a times, or I'm sorry, eight X minus four, four uh, A. But that expression still has to get multiplied by X squared plus eight X plus 16. Here I'm gonna multiply bx squared plus eight bx plus 16 b. Here I'm gonna multiply the c in, but I get cx plus four c. But again, that still has to get multiplied by this trinomial. And then finally I get dx squared minus eight dx plus 16 d. Okay, let's keep going. So 7x squared equal to ax cubed plus 8ax squared plus 16ax. Then negative 4ax squared and negative 32 ax and negative 64 a and then I have plus b x squared plus 8 b x plus 16 b over here I'm going to get c x cubed minus 8cx squared plus 16cx and then I'm going to get positive 4cx squared minus 32cx and plus 64c. Then here I still have plus dx squared minus 8dx plus 16d, sorry. So I have seven X squared equal to, it's really long, really, really long. And as long as this problem is, it is probably not the longest problem we will do in the semester. So you just have to be very, very careful. Is, the longer that a problem is, the more chances you are gonna make a mistake. So you really, I'm not trying to rush through it because if I do, I am more inclined to make a mistake that way. I may have already made a mistake. I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll see when we try to work this all out. So when I combine these two, I'm going to get 4ax squared minus 16ax minus 64a. 
I'm going to rewrite all of these terms together. I get negative 4cx squared minus 16cx plus 64c plus dx squared minus 8dx plus 16d. So then now we can do our coefficients. So I have no x cubes, but I have a plus c. I have 7x squared and I have 4a x squared plus b x squared minus 4c x squared and plus d. Then for x, I have no x's by itself on the left hand side, but on the right hand side, I have negative 16a x. I have plus 8bx, I have minus 16cx, and I have minus 8dx. Now on the constant, I have no constant on the left side, but I have negative 64a um, plus 16b plus 64c plus 16d. And so we end up with this expression here. Mm -hmm -hmm. This one is a doozy. I would definitely not do this to you on a test just because this problem takes forever to work out. But it is here in the homework and it would be a good idea for us to have an example, right? on how to work it out. So, the strategy when you're solving all these variables is to eventually get this down to two variables, okay? So that you can solve the two by two. Now I already have one equation with two variables in it. What I need to do is I need to figure out how to combine these um, equations to get another uh, equation with just a and c. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, we'll call this one equation one, equation two, equation three, and equation four. I'm going to take equation two and equation three. And what I want to do is I want to eliminate b. Then I'm going to take equation two and equation four and I'm going to eliminate B. So these new equations, I'm going to take these two new equations and I'm going to eliminate D. Because notice that equation one does not have the variables B or the variables D. Okay, so that's the game plan. And this is what I mean by um, it's necessary to explain what you're doing. So this is me explaining what I'm about to do. And then I'm going to go ahead and start doing that. So if I take equation two. And equation three. If I want to eliminate variable B, I need to multiply this whole thing by a negative eight. So that gives me negative 56, negative 32A, negative 8B, positive 32C, and negative 8D. And when I combine those, I get negative 56, negative 48A, the B's cancel, I get 16C minus 16D. I've done this first step. Now I'm going to take equation two again. And I'm going to take equation four.
and I'm going to eliminate B again. So here I'm going to need to multiply by negative 16. So negative 16 times 7 is negative 112. Negative 16 times negative 64 is, or I'm sorry, negative 16 times 4 is negative 64A. Negative 16 times this is negative 16B. That will be positive 64 and negative 16B. So I get negative 112 equal to negative 11. Is that 64? 128, I'm sorry. Negative 128A, these are gone, plus 128C, and these are gone. So I don't even need to take these two together and eliminate D because it already has D eliminated. It was coincidence that it just happened to eliminate it already. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I'm going to do now then is I'm going to take this new equation and equation uh, 1. So I have 0 equals A plus B. So I'm going to take this equation and multiply it by 128. So I still have 0, but now I have 128A plus 128C. And when I combine these two together, not this one, the one that's multiplied and this previous one. I end up with negative 112, negative 128, positive 128 cancel, and I end up with 256 times C. So if I divide this by 256, divide by 256, I get that C equals, I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel this ugly decimal, but it is, or ugly fraction, but it is an answer. So now we can take that C and plug it into equation one to figure out A. So if I add this number over, I'm gonna end up with positive seven over 16. So I've got two of my answers. I also have an equation here that already has A and C and it'll help me to solve for D. So I'm gonna plug in both of those numbers that I found. Times seven over 16 plus 16 times um, negative seven over 16 minus 16 D. So that is negative 21 minus 7 minus 16D, negative 56 plus 27 plus, or plus 21 plus 7 is negative 28, and then divide by negative 16. We get 7 over 4 for D. So that's another value I found. All I did was add 21 and add 7, and I got negative 28. Then the last thing to do is to find B, and we can find B by plugging it into any equation we want. I'm going to go ahead and plug it into equation 2, which is what I have here in this bracket. So it's going to be 7 equals 4 times 7 over 16 plus B minus four times C um, plus D. So we get seven equals seven over four plus B plus seven over four plus seven over four, which is 21 over four plus B. And then if I minus that, 7 minus 21 over 4 is 7 over 4. So 7 over 4 equals B. Man, so what does that mean the fraction looks like? The final answer will be A, which was 7 over 16, 
over x minus 4 plus b, which is 7 over 4, over x minus 4 squared plus c, which was negative 7 over 16 over x plus 4 plus d, which was um, 7 over 4 over x plus 4 squared. And again, this is not the formal way to write it. Since I do just have um, 16s here, this would be 7 over 16 plus 7 over 4. You could combine these because there's only one fraction here. And this would be the formal answer for that problem. Definitely, definitely a long one, right? It took us a page and a half to work that one out and a lot of brain power, okay? So I know it's ugly and I know it's ugly for the beginning of this course, but honestly, it's better you realize now that this course is gonna be pretty crazy <laughs> than halfway in, it just is, okay? So as long as you're able to follow along, you should be okay. Now, number seven is actually going to be case two and three together. So let me show you my camera again. Actually, oops, I forgot to write down a problem. So I had x plus seven over x squared x squared plus four. Now I really worked out the whole problem for the last one just because I knew it was gonna be long and ugly and I wanted you to have a game plan for it, okay? Um, for this one, I'm just gonna do the setup. So you do have a repeated linear factor. You should have a constant over that linear factor plus a constant over um, the square of that linear factor. This one though is a trinomial, it's a, a quadratic. Okay, so then you're going to have to have um, cx plus d, a linear factor over that quadratic factor. Okay, and then you can work it out. Now, some of you may eyeball this as a quadratic instead of a, so this could be a repeated linear. If you're seeing it as this, right? Or it could be a quadratic if you're visualizing it as this, okay? Now, I saw it as a repeated linear, but if you want to look at it as a quadratic, then what would your setup look like? It would look like AX, a linear thing, a linear numerator over that quadratic and then another linear um, numerator over the other quadratic. These are the same. Notice that if I try to get a common denominator here, I'm gonna end up with ax over x squared. ax plus b over x squared if I combine those two fractions together. So it really doesn't matter which one you're seeing you can do either one. What you don't want to do is get them confused and try to do them both at the same time. So you have to choose whether you're going to visualize x squared by itself as a repeated linear or as a quadratic, and then you can go from there. Let's go see what the very last problem is going to look like. Okay, this is the last problem um, we have, and it is number eight. So this one is actually going to be case four. Now we haven't gone into case four yet, but this one is going to be one because you have a prime quadratic here in the denominator, and it is squared, so it is repeated. So we definitely want to talk about how do we do that problem. 
And it is very similar to how we did the repeated linears, okay? So this is the process and it has, um, if you have a power on your uh, quadratic factor, you have to do it once over the quadratic and then a second one over the second quadratic with the square. Now, um, this one actually should be plus B1X plus B2C, or I'm sorry, X, um, plus B in X. So basically what happens is you're gonna have a linear expression over each quadratic term, okay? So we've got one that we're gonna have to work out. And then of course, I'll help you set up the one that is in the homework. Okay, so for this one, it's already got it factored for me. So I know I'm going to have a linear term over the quadratic itself plus a second linear term over the square of that quadratic. And then the LCD here will be x squared plus 4 squared. So then when I multiply that, here it will cancel. Here this will, one of them will cancel, but I'll still have AX plus B and X squared plus four. Over here, I will have the binomial, actually these will completely square. So I will have CX plus D all by itself. Then now I can FOIL that out. I have AX cubed plus 4AX plus BX squared plus 4B plus CX plus D. And then we'll do our coefficient. So I don't have any cubes over here. So that would be A all by itself. I do have one X squared, so that would be B. Um, I do have negative five for X. That would be four A plus B. And then I have a negative two for my constant and I have four B plus D. And so if you notice here, we already have a value for A and we already have a value for B. So I can plug in A here, and I get that negative five equals C, and I can plug in B here, and I get negative six equals D. And so then the fractions I will end up with our zero um, X, plus one over x squared plus four plus c, which is negative five x plus negative six over x squared plus four squared. Now to clean that up, you do not have to write zero x squared or zero x, I'm sorry. You could just write one over x squared plus four. And here I can write um, plus negative 5x minus 6. And again, if you want to take that minus out of there to make this more formal, you only have to do it when the minus is in front of the front term. This would become positive 5x and positive 6. Then these two together make minus. Five x plus 6 over x squared plus 4 squared. And that is the formal answer. So although this one is equivalent to it and it is perfectly fine to enter into my math uh, lab or my labs plus, um, this is the more formal answer and this will probably be what you'll need to use when you get to calculus because in I think in calculus 2 is where you'll use this. So you will be out of practice of it for a little while. 
But then when you come back in calculus, you definitely want to get, um, it's better to get the hang of it now than to have to remember the whole process and then remember how to do that too. It's always better just to be refreshed, right? Um, and then you it clicks again. Okay, so with that, we'll take a look at that last example that we had in the homework. Ignore that. That's all of my stuff for the next section. Um, what was the very last problem here? So the very last problem was number eight, 12.5, number eight. And we had x cubed. I'm sorry, x squared minus 3x plus 1 over x squared plus 9 squared. So the setup here, because it is a repeated quadratic, would be a linear over x squared plus 9 without the power, and then a linear over x squared plus 9 with the power. And then you would have to multiply everything by the LCD and start comparing your coefficients and the whole works. Okay? So I just wanted to do the setup there. So this video is probably taking us almost an hour and a half, which is about how long our class time would be if we were in a traditional classroom. So we've covered um one topic um and so then hopefully the next couple of sections i can cover a little bit faster this one is a little bit lengthy so we had to um, go over all of that but hopefully this helps again it's a big long video but hopefully um you will be able to rewind fast forward pause do all that good stuff for to really concentrate on all the bits of information that you need. But I hope you guys have a great day and I encourage you to get 2.5 done as soon as you finish watching this video, just because the more recent you do something after you intake the information, the better you are at kind of regurgitating it. Um, but revisit it too every now and then just so that you can make sure that you have it all in your head especially to prepare for tests. But that is it. 